Hello and welcome to Opening Bars. Billy Preston is one of those guys that most professionals in the music industry would surely know, but he would be perhaps less well known to the general public had it not been for several hit songs he wrote as a solo performer, notably That's the Way God Planned It, Out of Space, Will It Go Round in Circles, Space Race, and With You I'm Born Again. He wrote songs for other well-known artists too, including Love the One You're With, recorded by Stephen Sills, and the very moving You Are So Beautiful by Joe Cocker. But many may not know just how influential and respected he was as a sideman and session musician. His list of professional associations is impressive, including Mahalia Jackson, Ray Charles, Sly and the Family Stone, Eric Clapton, The Rolling Stones, and The Band. Just take a look at his Wikipedia page under the heading as a guest session performer for a who's who of famous collaborators. He may, in fact, be most recognizable to many for his work with the Beatles, particularly during the so-called Get Back Sessions. It is said that the lads referred to him as the Fifth Beatle. He subsequently also established a long-time friendship and working partnership with George Harrison after the band's breakup in 1970. The song we're going to look at today, Nothing From Nothing, was a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, and Billy performed this song on the very first airing of Saturday Night Live on October the 11th, 1975, as one of the first musical guests on that brand new television show. Let's take a closer look at these opening bars. Nothing says this is going to be a wacky romp more than the first four bars that introduce this song. It's a phrase that is now known as the Minsky pickup, culminating in the da 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 hey rhythmic melodic motif. Its origins likely harken back to the vaudeville burlesque era, possibly to the entertainment enterprise run by the Minsky brothers in New York, beginning in the 1930s. Intros, of course, were a big part of the musical vocabulary of the time as a type of fanfare, perhaps to announce a song and dance number. Anyway, this prefix, and most noticeably the last two bars of the lick, has continued to appear in numerous other popular songs, television, movies, and video games too. Think Look by the Beach Boys, Weird Al Yankovic, PDQ Bach, The Singing Telegram Girl from the 1985 movie Clue, The Gong Show, The Simpsons, Monty Python's Holy Grail, and even Super Mario Land. I sometimes wonder if this intro may even be a remnant echo of Ragtime, that syncopation in a four-bar intro on the dominant in octaves, culminating in a very strong 5-7 hit, is something we saw in the Entertainer episode of Opening Bars. The next eight measures are so much fun. A miniaturized call and response, a C7 chord, then F over a C pedal of sorts, which makes the A and F passing tones, I suppose, ending again on the C7. This happens three times. And the fourth one seems to introduce a bit more of a B natural in the mix. I'm not sure if that's a mistake or a stylistic affectation. Anyway, in between are fantastic bluesy licks again, based on C7, mimicking the left hand, with a hint of five again walking up in the bass guitar before it reiterates. Anyway, harmonically speaking, nothing very advanced or tricky here, just one, shades of four, and a little five. Let's look at the rhythm. 
First, a quick note on the time signature. As you can see, there is a symbol here instead of the usual numerical fraction. This is a leftover from the late medieval Renaissance mensural notation, where a circle would represent tempus perfectum, nowadays known as three-quarter time, a three-quarter note pulse in each measure. A tempus imperfectum would be anything other, including an open or broken circle, which looks a lot like the letter C and would be equivalent to our 4-4 four, four common time. And the tempus imperfectum diminutum, which would be the same broken circle with a vertical line through it. And that's what we would consider 2-2, two, two, or two half note pulses per measure, also known as cut common time. This time signature here is an easy way to simplify the notation, usually for pieces that are quick and may have a lot of smaller note values if written in common time. I think what I find fascinating here is, while it feels rather jaunty, but in some respects, it's also quite straight too. The moments of syncopation are in the anticipation of the C C7 in the right hand, and the little pickups in the left hand, and of course, the most prominent one in the bass guitar, accentuated by a drum kit. Anyway, make sure, when you play this, to really highlight the differences between the straight rhythms and the offbeat entries. You can even push the syncopations a little bit for added excitement. But this means also paying close attention to the rests. Now that you know the notes, you can concentrate on advancing specific attributes, notably that of style. Billy himself called this piece a saloon style. While I personally think the opening bars feel more gospely bluesy, the piano solo section is different. So perhaps if we look at that, maybe we can determine what saloon style might mean exactly. I think the most notable characteristic of this section is the syncopation, especially right before beat one of each measure. Also notice that alteration between fuller four-note chords interjected with melodic riffs in octaves, and the ripply shake that is somewhat idiosyncratic. And finally, of course, the timbre of this particular instrument itself is a little honky-tonk as well. Now that I think about it, it sounds an awful lot like the piano music of Mrs. Mills. It has the syncopation, the rich chords and octave riffs, is played on the same kind of out-of-tune piano, and is full of the same kind of joyfulness. And knowing that Billy was at Abbey Road in the late 60s, he may have even met her, or at least, most certainly knew of her. Now, if you don't know who she is, I think you should. A somewhat unlikely hero, she was discovered in 1961 playing part-time piano in a club in Essex, England. She was recruited and signed to a recording contract and was to become quite celebrated, recording over 40 albums and became a household name in the process. An interesting side note here, and this is a quote from Wikipedia. The name Mrs. Mills was given to a vintage 1905 Steinway Verta Grand piano, frequently used by her at Abbey Road Studios in London 
where she recorded. The piano, with a characteristic out-of-tune honky-tonk sound, has remained in use at Abbey Road for over 50 years and was used in countless recordings made there, including some by the Beatles. Her story is fascinating. When You're Smiling was one of the first songs I ever heard her play from a recording, so in honor of her and Billy Preston, I've transcribed a couple of refrains from the original medley and will play it more or less note for note, except a bit slower, and for authenticity's sake, I'll even play most of the extra and wrong note bits in the original. Somehow, to me, it's still just perfect. I hope you enjoyed your lesson today. Remember, don't just play notes. Make music. Until next time, thanks for listening.